So, I spent today binging all of Netflix's Avatar The Last Airbender, and I'd very much like to make a big video breaking down my thoughts in depth. Let me know if you would like that, because there is a lot to say, both good and bad, but today we're going to focus on two precise points. Two flaws at the heart of this show's writing that I actually think are the root cause for most of the stuff that doesn't quite work. Starting with its structure, eight episodes each 60 minutes, although some of them are short Shorter than that. It's still technically a similar amount of minutes overall to the original show's 20 episodes of 22-ish minutes in length, but now you're denied the space to have 20 or maybe 18 considering the two-part episodes. 18 individual stories with their own important beats that conclude in moments of character growth. Now you only get 8, but with 60 minutes you could expand them more so that those moments really hit and get real exploration in theory. I talked about this in my prediction video for the show, so I'm not going to dwell on that point too much, but if you've only got eight episodes to work with, I think ideally you either need more episodes or you have to be absolutely ruthless with what plot points you're cutting out from the original show. And to be honest, for eight episodes, I don't think this show cut enough. You end up with King Boomy, Jet, the Mechanist, Iroh being captured, some moments with Azula, Zhao, all that stuff in a single episode. Technically a two-parter for Boomy, but still. And again, it's not like you can bounce from one of those plot points to another. You can't go through Jet and then move to the Mechanist in a single episode. No, this is in need of stuff to weave all of them into a single coherent story, and the show really struggles to do that effectively enough. I'll try and explain what I mean in a second, but I need to say first, this stuff could work. I'm not the sort of person to sit here and go, gah, they changed this thing, I don't like that, you've now lost what made that thing so impactful in the original version, I don't like change. <laughs> because yeah, you do lose something in most changes, that's inevitable, but that doesn't mean there isn't also an advantage to the change as well. In theory, I think a lot of the changes this show makes are good ideas for what this wants to be. Zhao had a very different dynamic with Zuko here for a lot of this, and whilst I think I still prefer the original version of Zhao, I do commend what they tried to do here. I think it does work as a concept. Well executed though? Nah, maybe with Xiao, but in the case of Amashu, no, it's a mess. An episode of a TV show has to be like a chapter of a book. You know, it can exist within the tapestry of a larger, overarching show, but it still needs to deliver a clear, solid story that follows right through to the end of the episode with some sense of a climax. The closest thing we have to tie Jet and the Mechanist and Boomy together story-wise, rather than just plot-wise, is some vague question of there being a traitor in Omashu. Katara thinking the traitor is the Mechanist, Sokka thinking it's Jet, the slight conflict between which side do we trust that never quite reaches an impactful conclusion at the end here. But there's what your structure could be for this episode. Frame the whole episode around that mystery. Omashu isn't safe because there's a traitor. Who is it? Who can we trust? How do we resolve this? Only that mystery isn't really introduced until halfway through, and it's not even that much of a mystery, and again there isn't much conclusion to tie it together at the end. Structure is the problem here, the lack of it is what stops the individual story beats from landing as effectively as they could. Most of this just feels like Katara doing some stuff, Sokka doing some stuff, Thang doing some stuff, Zuko doing some stuff, and then each individual stuff ends, and you're not entirely sure the characters have grown or what has happened apart from plot heavy events. You can tell the writers had real trouble trying to weave events together because they keep having to clunkily throw in a voiceover narration to end episodes. It's only after we've lost something that we realize how much it means to us. That's why we must let go of our pain and regret. But I suppose it can be scary to admit you need people. We tell ourselves we are the problem. Iroh or Ang or Gyatso say something concluding in a voiceover that makes it sound like we've reached some kind of ending. Like episode 6 genuinely does something pretty good with the idea of masks to tie different characters' threads together with this one symbol. That's quite nice, but because the structure never quite complements that idea, you then need Iroh explaining about masks in a narration and how this episode has all been about different characters finding themselves or hiding themselves. You need that explained to make it feel like they have 
tied it together, you know? Episode 1 completely kills its good moments with the structure, and there's a lot I could explain about Episode 1, I think, but as one minor example for how the structure can damage the characters, Momo. In the original show, Momo is important for what he means to Aang about his culture and about being the last airbender. Aang meets Momo early into the episode, but then he finally bonds with Momo as part of the concluding idea these flying lemurs are a part of my roots, my people may be gone but my culture can still live on, kind of thing. You, me, and Appa, we're all that's left of this place. We have to stick together. Momo gets to actually mean something, and that's part of the conclusion to the episode. It's part of what helps Aang move forwards here. It's character growth for him. But in this show, we see the Southern Air Temple at the end of episode one. Aang has his character beat there to find Gyatso, be torn up about it, be comforted by Katara, but the emphasis is on Sokka and her providing family. That being the important end point, rather than ideas of his culture culture or of Momo, because the structure of this first episode is built around the gang coming together, so th th that's the point they emphasise here. Therefore this is no longer the right place to bond with Momo, therefore we meet Momo right at the start of the next episode. But now the beat where Aang was torn up and in need of comfort has already passed. Plus this episode wants to get on with new events, new story, heading to Kiyoshi, so Momo then doesn't get a proper story moment to actually mean anything to Aang. They breeze through him in like 10 seconds. Oh, here's a flying lemur, that's cool, let's take him with us. Why Momo actually matters as a character is then never expressed at all in this show. He feels solely like a gimmick who never even gets that much space for comedy anyway, and I genuinely forgot about Momo in this show until something abrupt happened in episode 8. But all of that is the result of the structure, you see? I hope I've explained that well, I could give so many other examples, but I won't. I'll instead give you another symptom that results from this bad structuring, and then we'll move on to my next point. The symptom being Aang, Sokka, and Katara are starved of moments either to just bond as characters, or even just to work together. It wasn't until episode 7 where they take down a Fire Nation ship, Sokka showing his inventiveness and leadership, Aang and Katara showing their air and water bending. It's kind of a moment taken straight from the original show, but it's a nice bit. That, in episode 7, was one of the few notable moments where the team really worked together to achieve something. We needed more of that! But when you're condensing the show to 8 episodes, and you're focusing on the main character beats, it's then that you notice a lot of those big character moments from the original show actually happen with the gang on their own, or at least not together. Sokka's clearest moments of growth here happen when he's with Suki, or he's with the Mechanist, or he's with Yue, rather than with Katara or Aang, which is fine, but when those moments are mostly all we get in this show, suddenly the gang don't have much time to spend with each other, and that is a big problem. Them three are supposed to be the main point here. Episode 5 had Sokka and Katara entering the spirit world with Aang, and I thought, Okay, a bit odd, but that makes sense, because we need an episode focused on the three of them together. This could be a place to do that, except then the plot split all three of them up and they don't meet each other again until the end of the next episode. God damn it. <laughs> like, I know there isn't going to be as much time, and I know you can't do the cartoon thing where each episode is pretty much structured to begin and end with the three of them flying away on Arpa, pulling everything back to their bonds, that kind of safe space at the end. I get why that structure wouldn't work for the live action adaptation, I think it makes sense they don't do that here, but they do still need time with them as a team, you know? Anyway, I want to discuss the other main issue with this show now, that will be point two this video, but first, you know how I am with World Ambu. Right, there goes the saviour of the world. World Anvil! Yep, they sponsored this video, they're still here, hopefully they'll stay here. Uh, Wild Anvil is an online tool for building worlds, creating characters, designing and managing campaigns for a whole sleuth of games. Sleuth isn't the right word, I don't know why I said that. Look, you can do all that, you can plan and write stories, you can do all sorts of different stuff for creative projects. I use it for the world building of my novel because my old system of massive word documents became far too chaotic. Not only does the ability to create timelines with high 
hyperlinks branching off to specific characters or articles or a billion other things. Not only does that make it so much easier to quickly find the information I need, it also makes it so much easier to plan things out and kind of keep going. Sometimes a blank word document for world building is very daunting, so having all sorts of tools to help with visualization, to help you figure out what needs planning next, to keep your brain fizzing and unimpeded because all of the tools are very straightforward and easy to use. That's really important to me. It's like the sharper an artist's pencils, the freer they are to focus on the art. World Anvil is a very sharp pencil. You can create mind maps, you can rearrange elements of your story, do all sorts of campaign related things for that sleuth of games I mentioned. Um, yes, link in the description and as a pinned comment should you desire a 51% discount on all their subscriptions or if you're not yet sure then try out the free version for as long as you like. That's what I did at first and now look where I am, <laughs> shouting their name at you through a screen. World Anvil! This show has a serious problem with dialogue. I don't mean in a laughably bad or cheesy or Madam Web sort of way. I just mean all of the characters talk in the same rough voice and they struggle to actually develop things and make story happen within the dialogue. Like the obvious example for me would be to say that 90% of the conversations are based around revealing backstory of some sort. Either someone explaining something from their past that is troubling them or there's flashbacks. <laughs> so many flashbacks. Like take this example from episode 2, we need to express that Aang is daunted by his responsibility as the Avatar in a world that's at war. He is scared what fighting in a war might mean. How do you express that? Do you do it organically through his behaviour? Do you have him try to avoid dwelling on ideas of responsibility? Maybe distracting himself with fun or being a goofy kid? You know, there are other various possibilities of doing this. The original show is just one example, but um, this show doesn't do that stuff. It just has Aang tell you very directly. I never wanted to fight and I'm afraid of hurting someone. Then you follow it up with a backstory example from his past, complete with shots of his memories. Back home, the other kids used to say I was lucky because I never really had to train. But I did have to train. And you see these shots while he's explaining that he had to learn how to control his powers better so he didn't hurt people. What if I never learn how to control my power? How many people will I hurt? And then Katara gets a few lines to comfort him about this. A lot of scenes of someone being troubled by something, expressing backstory to make that point, and then the other person saying something kind of a bit dramatic to try and provide an answer. Sometimes that kind of scene is fine. Aang is an example of it here that does bother me more because, you know, for all this show keeps having characters tell us in dialogue how much of a goofy kid Aang is, how he's fun, he's entertaining, how he needs to be more serious and face up to the responsibility more and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> Despite being told that, you do rarely get to see him be a kid. The one example I can think of is this girl asking if he can airbend and him then going off with them to show off his skills whilst we cut away from this important character moment to instead have a clunky monologue between Suki and her mum. Dialogue, not monologue, although a lot of the dialogue does involve long monologue speeches. I like to play air ball and eat banana cakes and goof off with my friends. That's who I am. But yeah, sometimes this can be fine, it's just not all the time, just not having this as the stock formula for every scene of dialogue. Three years. Three years. There were times I thought I'd never find the Avatar. My mother was a fighter in our family. She taught me the blade. It was quiet. And then my mom died. When I was a kid, I used to hide out here when my dad would meet with the elders. And despite all my sacrifices, I still couldn't save the one that mattered the most. Not long after I was born, I got very sick. Everyone ends up sounding the same, and if your characters aren't 
you know, <laughs> expressing their character in their dialogue, then they stop feeling real. And backstory isn't character. It can be a tool for expressing character, but it has to be earned. Iroh is the most egregious example this series of being so keen to have us understand his past, instead of letting us be intrigued about it, letting him breathe as a person in the present before washing it all in memories of the past. Backstory ends up getting in the way of character here, plus it doesn't help the pace especially when there's a billion flashbacks. And even when the dialogue isn't drawing on backstory, you can feel the gears turning within the script. You can see what the writers need the characters to say for story reasons. Like in episode 1, Aang is absolutely on the nose, multiple times telling us that he is afraid of being the Avatar. I never asked to be special. Can't I just keep pretending I'm your friend? I don't want the power. Why do I have to be different? I don't want the responsibility. I'm scared of my power. I'm scared of being alone. Monks don't even trust me to feed the baby bison and I'm supposed to save the world? So many monologues that are so keen to be as dramatic and profound as possible as though they're desperate to be clipped up for TikTok or quoted or something. And the violins are always swelling beneath the words until the drama kind of ends up feeling sentimental to me here. Every possible good character moment gets diluted in sentimentality. Paul Sun Hyung Lee as Iroh is easily my favourite performance in this show. This is his own version of Iroh. I like that he's gone with something a little bit different, but he still very much caught the essence of the original Iroh. Quail Poleg, very good for... Vitality? Vitality! And I just adore the... Oliver Hardy qualities he's brought to this. Like seriously, think of Oliver Hardy in all Iroh scenes and you'll spot exactly what I mean. It's great. I'll have some jasmine tea sent to you. It's quite soothing. <laughs> But part of why he works so well is because he does get actual lines of dialogue to express character with, like talking about food and tea, or even when a script does want him to say something dramatic or profound, a wise old character like him or Gyatso can pull that off much easier. But most of the time the dialogue under delivers and it's a great shame. I don't hate this show though. I know I've talked a lot of negatives here, but I think there was a great respect for the source material. I don't think this is a lazy, shallow cash grab of a show at all. I think genuine effort and care was put into making this, but unfortunately they didn't quite succeed. Particularly, that is obviously in relation to structure and dialogue, those are the things I've talked about and I think all of that hampers the genuine potential this show had. But give it a watch if you haven't, let me know what you think, let me know if you want a longer video discussing more. That's all I'll say because I need to shut up and get this video edited before I leave for my girlfriends tomorrow. Like I woke up at 8 this morning, binged a load of this show, then went to work doing counselling and then got home, watched the rest and recorded this. It's now half one in the morning, I'm about to go to sleep. <laughs> if the editing of the video is a little bit shoddy, I apologise. I just want to get this out while it's still topical. But let me know what you think. Like this video if you liked it. Subscribe. Support me on Patreon. But otherwise... My commentary! And as ever, a special thank you goes to Grace, Luke Corr, Treat You Caber, Michael Gallagher, Flying Spider, Kellyanne Davidson, Samara Salsi, Joshua C. Follier and Chad Bramwell. Thank you.